The following programming is made possible through a generous donation from Randall Lewis, Executive Vice President of Upland-based Lewis Operating Companies. Welcome to uh, a Randall Lewis uh a seminar we're really excited uh, today about a topic which we've looked forward to for a long time and it's hard to realize we're 13 days away from the uh, midterm election here in the United States and in California. Uh, today we uh, are going to have a, a conversation with uh, John Myers who has this extraordinary both experience and position of looking at uh, California politics, attempting to explain it in ways that uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can understand. And I think uh, we'd like to sort of begin by really finding a little bit about uh, John Myers and uh, who he is and how he <laughs> became a, a, an important journalist in, uh, in, uh, in California. Uh, well, background. thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, it's a kind introduction of, uh, of, of somebody who covers politics, which is an exhausting thing these days. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the story, like so many people in California, is I, I'm a California immigrant. I grew up on the East Coast and came to graduate school to California and never left. Um, I've been, uh, mainly most of my career was in broadcast news, uh, in public radio, and then in local television. Yeah. And uh, for the last few years, I've been the bureau chief of the Los Angeles Times up in Sacramento, and there's never been a dull moment up there. So it uh, uh, keeps us busy. How did you go from a Berkeley student into um, <laughs> public broadcasting? Uh, well, I mean, first it was in television. Um, and and I, I came to journalism a, a little bit later than some of my colleagues, not immediately out of college, largely because I thought journalism was a public service, which I think is the reason a lot of folks get involved mm -hmm. in elected office and certainly in public policy. Um, and then the, the long, strange trip of anybody's career where you get lucky a couple of breaks if you're in the right place. And um, I spent about a decade covering state politics uh, in Sacramento for the NPR affiliate out of San Francisco, KQED. Yeah. And uh, I started that job, uh, that particular job, right before the recall of Gray Davis happened. So uh, it was uh, just a wild moment from there, from uh, an action hero governor to a governor returning to whoever the next governor is going to be. So it's been a lot of fun. Just real briefly, what, what are some of the changes you've seen since you started in journalism and mm -hmm. uh, how it's taking form now? The, kind of the disappearance of the sort of legacy media, the... Uh, the increasing importance of what you find on the internet, uh, the kind of imposition virtually of, of national issues at, at, the, at the state level. Uh, I mean, I think the biggest change is certainly the change that all of us live with every day, which is uh, if I'd had my smartphone here in front of the camera, I would have shown it. It's the, the, um, the ready access of information every moment, all the time, anything you want to know virtually. Certainly has changed the news business a lot. Yeah. Um, I like to tell people, that when I got into journalism, which was in the early 1990s, um, we were still talking about the 24, uh, 24 hour news cycle. Mm -hmm. Then it became to me the 24 second news cycle. Mm -hmm. And now with the advent of social media, especially like Twitter, it's the 24 character news cycle. We are on a continual loop of, uh, of happening by happening by happening. The good part, of course, is that people can, um, they can keep up to date anytime they want. Mm -hmm. The tough part, I think, of that, really challenging part for, for journalists, I think, is the ability to have time to reflect on what they've seen and write something substantive, the time to offer context or perspective or explanation to the public. Um, it's really contracted right now with everybody wanting everything yeah. so fast. Well, why don't we talk about this? Uh, I mean, the election at one time seemed very, very far away. We're right. now at 30, now. 13 days, <laughs> right. thir 13 days and, uh, and counting. And I, maybe we can do this in sort of three parts. I mean, wh one is uh, there's going to be a change in Sacramento. Jerry Brown, after uh, four terms in office, is exiting. Mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be obviously a new administration. And, uh, uh, and you know, the outcome looks fairly predictable by polls. The Democrats were essentially, it looks like for most statewide offices are going to be. But how is, 
How have you seen this, uh, not the national issues, but the state issues take form in this uh, election in 2018? Well, it's hard to separate the two, right? I mean, we certainly all know um, how many things have become nationalized in this particular election cycle that we're sitting in. Um, and I'm very mindful of where we were in the last, you know, nationally we call it the midterm election, but in California we would call it a gubernatorial election. Where we were sitting in the last gubernatorial election in, in 2014, um, where we had the lowest turnout of California voters in any general election since 1918. Uh, and I'm going to make one bold prediction for you right now. We're going to beat that number uh, come November 6th this year. But um, it really has felt, the last two years in particular, it has felt as though we are living part of a national dialogue in California. I certainly think if you look at Sacramento, the reaction of Democrats who are in control, both the governorship and the legislature, uh, to the election of President Trump was uh, to launch what they've called the resistance, yeah. the, the resistance movement. Uh, fighting on immigration, fighting on health care, uh, fighting for states' rights, which I may say for a moment is fascinating because a state like California, when Democrats were in power in Washington, were more about the federal process, and now we're more like Texas was during That's the right, Obama right. era yeah. of fighting for states' rights. So it really has been a, a, a very nationalized period, I would say. And at the same time, we've seen uh, the economy in California continue to improve. Yeah. We've seen unemployment go down. Um, but we have these, uh, and then we've seen the state's finances improve, but we still have these intractable issues of housing, transportation, poverty, that I think the next governor and the next legislature are going to have to pick up the ball on. I was trying to think of what people are talking about in terms of this election. Uh, it is not state issues, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it uh, really isn't. It's really the, isn't. You said this sort of nationalizing of, of, of California. California politics. Uh, I think immigration has been one of the most obvious places of that, if I can think of what's happened over the last year, when we've seen uh, certainly the change in immigration policy from Washington yeah. to President Trump, um, and then you've seen the enactment of pretty substantial um, uh, laws on the state level, most notably the law that limits the uh, cooperation, the role between local law enforcement and federal immigration agents. I think that is a really good example of where uh, the national and the state have blended together. If you look at public polling, it shows that Californians, by and large, uh, want California to have a role in immigration policy. Yeah. But I think that's also a reflection of how California is at a different place uh, than President Trump and national Republicans. Um, so it's uh, it's been an interesting time. Do you want to comment on the uh, the U.S. Senate race? I mean, uh, <laughs> which is uh, you know it's the first time, right, where we've had people uh, from the same party. Second time, uh, second Kamala time. Harris beat Loretta Sanchez okay, in 2016. That's, that's right. But that's it, right. It is a very new phenomenon yeah. because of the top two primary yeah. system, and uh, uh, it, it's. I think there are a lot of questions that the Senate races, the last two in particular, have raised about the top two primary system. Uh, people will remember. Uh, especially if they voted in 2010, that voters approved the top two system. Yeah. Top two remove, uh, regardless of party, move on to the November yeah. election. But in that Senate race, um, especially this year, you have a choice between a center-left Democrat, Dianne Feinstein, yeah. versus a left-left Democrat in state uh, Senator Kevin yeah. DeLeon. And there are a lot of Republicans, there are a lot of uh, independent voters who are telling pollsters they're going to sit it out. And I think that raises real questions about the efficacy of that uh, change. Any other of the uh, statewide campaigns, uh, statewide office holders has caught your attention in, uh, in 2018? Well, I think it's hard for any of them to catch anyone's attention. It's been <laughs> a really quiet year, yeah. I think, for uh, statewide elected officials. Clearly, the governor's race, Gavin Newsom, John Cox at the top of that. Uh, Newsom has been ahead in all the polls. Uh, I think Newsom has positioned himself very clearly as the uh, as the counter voice to Donald Trump. And if, should he win, if the polls are right, I think yeah. he's going to have to figure how to govern as that kind of person. Uh, John Cox, the Republican businessman from San Diego, has had a hard time getting attention or raising money for his yeah. race. Yeah. And I think you know, to your uh, point about this, or my point about the statewide overall. That's kind of the challenge for Republicans in the state. They have not won a statewide elected office since 2006. It's been 12 years. Um, one of those people was an Austrian Hollywood movie star in 2006. And the other one 
is running again uh, for his old job, Steve Poisoner's insurance commissioner, but is no longer a Republican, has re-registered sure. as an independent, a no-party preference voter. I think that speaks volumes about the challenge of the Republican yeah. brand in California. Poisoner has a chance to win. To, um... He's got money. Uh, and that helps. And his challenger, Ricardo Lara, a Democratic state senator, has not had as much money. I think the real thing here, though, is um, uh, you and I were talking about this being kind of a Trump election. Yep. How much oxygen is there for any race other than that national narrative, whether it's statewide offices or these ballot measures that we're considering? Before going to the ballot measures, why don't we? I mean, what's caught so many people's attention in California election this year is the congressional, uh, the uh, six, seven, eight. You, you, you have a better count of the numbers that perhaps are in play. Uh, you know, traditionally, incumbents get reelected. I mean, right. That's just what happens. Uh, they, they have resources. They have name identification. Uh, uh, do you want to, I mean, there's a amount, amount of money, I think, is unprecedented that's been raised for these congressional camp. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about these six, eight uh, congressional campaigns which are in play? Well, let's, uh, let's see if we can uh, use a number based on, on uh, the data, so to speak. So uh, if you look at the congressional districts that have been represented by Republicans in which Hillary Clinton beat Donald Trump in 2016, there are seven seven in California out of 14 districts represented by Republicans. That's half the Republican seats. Oh. So that became the battleground right from the get-go, you know, with the Democratic Party believing that these were not Trump voters and that a Trump election could be tough mm. for those Republicans. In some cases, the Republicans in those seats have retired. Ed Royce in Orange County, Daryl Issa uh, in the San Diego region. Uh, but at this juncture, there are six, seven, eight uh, races where Democrats nationally are making a bid for that, uh, clustered in Orange County, um, also in the outskirts of Los Angeles County, the um, no. Steve Knight District in the yeah. 25th Congressional District, uh, and in the Central Valley, a couple of Republicans there, Jeff Denham and David Valadeo. And then, of course, we throw into that mix uh, seats that look to be safe Republican normally, but are somewhat in play. That's Devin Nunes in the Central Valley, largely because Nunes is a lightning rod for the Trump uh, uh, era and the investigation of Russian meddling in the election, and Duncan Hunter in San Diego, sure. who is uh, currently under indictment for campaign finance uh, violations alleged. And so if you look at the money, uh, you're exactly right, you look at the money in these races, somewhere on the magnitude of $120 million uh, has come into these races. That is a, a lot of money for congressional races, which don't usually play at the sure. level of ballot measures and things in California. The polling suggests that Democrats are well poised to pick up four or five of those. And then the real question is, what do we see on election day? Is it the famed uh, blue tide, the tide of Democratic voters that sweeps more Republicans out? Or is it more of a, of a tepid turnout, in which case Democrats don't win as many? I do think, though, I will say, at the end of the day, you're going to see a smaller Republican congressional delegation from California. And remember, it's only 14 of the 53 seats right now are Republicans. I think it's safe to say it's going to be fewer than 14 uh, come the day after the election. As a newspaper, how do you cover uh, congressional campaigns? Because they're obviously uh, in particular geographic places. Uh, uh, how, how, how has the LA Times covered these uh, campaigns? Huh? Well, we've put a, um, the, the newspaper has put a lot more effort into this congressional cycle, I think, than it probably has had to in years past because it is so at the center of the California political yeah. story and the national political yeah. story. Um, our uh, new executive editor, Norman Perlstein, came in, and I think one of his early marching orders was that we were going to ensure that we were in all of these races. So we have around a dozen people who are wow. involved in that wow. congressional coverage of just those battleground seats themselves. And you're right, they are spread out a little bit, but they tell really fascinating stories, I think, not only about what's going on nationally and the reflection into California, but how some local issues from water to transportation to other things are, um, are playing in these races. And I think they, they offer a really good glimpse at the, the challenge of um, successful politics in California right now. The other part of elections, thanks uh, to the progressives uh, with, with initiatives, referendum recalls, is the ballot measures. Mm -hmm. What do we have? Levin on, uh, uh, 
uh, I guess some are more visible and right. uh, more contested uh, than others. Uh, you want to make any reflections on the uh, on the ballot measures before the voters? Well, we, we could have had more. <laughs> we, <laughs> well, uh, one was taken off. Yeah, right? one was taken off by the courts, and uh, two or three others were poised to get on the ballot. And at least in in uh, one case, the legislature came to a compromise with that ballot measures proponents. It was on privacy issues and enacted a law. But we've got eleven. Uh, I put them in in. Um, categories kind of based on what they do. They're bond measures that Californians know those well from the past. There's about $16 billion in bonds on the, the November ballot. There are a couple related to health care, dialysis clinics for kidney uh, 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 patients, uh, ambulance services, and the rest breaks that ambulance workers get. Um, but really the marquee measures, I would argue, when you look at um, the California experience, are the effort to repeal the new gas tax increase, which is Prop 6. six and the rent control measure, Prop 10. Uh, Prop 10 simply says that local communities could enact more rent control than they can now, um, but um, has been the subject of a very intense campaign by the apartment industry and others, and is struggling in the polls. Yeah. If you looked at the next 10, where lines up all the kind of judgments been made from uh, partisan groups and nonpartisan groups and newspapers, I, the LA Times is one of the few papers that endorse Prop 10. Uh, and that's almost news to me. I can tell you the editorial side of the newspaper is uh, we call it the church and state. Like we don't know, <laughs> we don't know what they do and they don't ask us what we do. And so I almost don't, I, I really honestly really don't much keep track of what yeah. they do in those things. But it has been interesting to watch the Prop 10 discussion because I think it's a, it's a microcosm of the issue of housing in California and yeah. affordable housing and the fact that we have so many places where people are priced out. I mean, just on rents alone, I was looking this up the other day. Uh, I mean, places like San Francisco, the median, the median uh, for a one bedroom apartment is $3,800 a month. That seems hard to uh, argue being sustainable in a state that uh, needs yeah. to grow and needs to change. And so I think Prop 10 somehow crystallizes part of that discussion about housing. Yeah, housing is not simply what a, a problem. It's not simply a crisis for the state. It right. is. It, 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 it. I mean, it's kind of a. It's hard to. I'm not sure what the language you use to describe. Uh, well, I think it touches everything. Yeah. It touches. It, it is. It is. A, it, it is very much a part of the California experience at this point. I think even if we were to be historians and look back, yeah. people came to California in search of the ability to have affordable housing and good schools and good roads. And we didn't talk about Prop Six, by the way, yeah. but. Prop 10 and Prop 6, which talk about uh, taxes and roads and housing, I think really get to what it means to, to be a Californian, to the yeah. quality of life right. and to what it's going to yeah. look like. Prop 6, I mean, I was listening to Bedora at the, uh, on the radio station. They, they were having this series of ads opposing. Uh, there's quite a bit of money in opposition to 6 and less, yeah. less around to, uh, in favor. Yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. Prop 6 got on the ballot um, and, of course, I think one of the challenges before I say this is that Prop 6, if you vote yes, you're voting yes to repeal the tax. It's somewhat yeah. of a mixed message there. Yeah. You know, to be no on the tax, you have to be yes on 6. I think that's hindered uh, some of their messaging. But it really has only had money from two sources, and that's John Cox, the Republican for governor, who helped put it on the ballot, and Republican members of Congress, Kevin McCarthy, Mimi Walters from Orange County, who, uh, whose campaigns wrote money to get it on the ballot, hoping that it would motivate Republican or anti-tax voters who might be their voters to show up and help them keep their jobs in those uh, House districts across California. But it has been swamped by money from uh, organized labor, uh, construction companies in particular. Uh, we wrote a story the other day showing how construction companies that will do the work of repairing the roads have opened up their bank accounts and written checks yeah. to, try to, uh, to try to protect the gas tax partially because they see it as good business. Um, and I, I, it's one of those issues that everybody is acutely aware of. Everybody fills up their car. Everybody knows the price of gas yeah. in California. Uh, uh, I am really fascinated, though, if I may say, that California's historical uh, position as an as a tax anti-tax state or a state where taxes don't do well yeah. on the ballot, uh, this will be an interesting moment for that, just like those income tax uh, measures yeah. in 2012 and 16. Um, I'm not ready to say that California has changed on the issue of taxes, but it's fascinating that this one's struggling in the polls. 
Yeah, I saw where the, the fellow running against uh, Hunter uh, with the uh, laborers withdrawn their support because he was uh, came out in favor of, of or at least he didn't in endorse the no vote on uh, on on six. Also yeah. happened in an Orange County congressional race, exactly oh, yeah. where it's been aside uh, apart from the Democratic Party, right? Yeah. Well, as you uh, as you step back and there are, uh, how do you and uh, it is now uh, you know, ten o'clock on uh, uh, November uh, November sixth, um, uh, and I'm still writing. By the way, I'm on deadline. But you're on ahead. deadline. <laughs> how, how, how do you how, how do you be how do you see the story being framed? I think I think it depends on which story we're trying to tell. Um, and by that, I mean, if we are, um, if we're telling the story that you and I've been sitting here talking a little bit about, um, how California fits in the national political narrative, I think it's going to, I think it's very likely going to be, um, another chapter, a stronger chapter, a more, uh, robust drama about California's role as pushing back against the, um, the, the era of Donald Trump, the era of Republican mm -hmm. leadership in Washington. I think if you're looking more inside California, I think it's going to be, and I look at the top of the ticket, Gavin Newsom, John Cox, if Newsom prevails, and the polling suggests yeah. he would prevail, um, I think, and, and either man, if he wins, I should say this in a way, um, it really is a new chapter in California history. I, I would argue that uh, the Governor Brown, fourth term, as we know, two, and then he took a break, and two again, yeah. Uh, Governor Brown, in many ways to me, uh, covering him through the years, has felt like the, the last chapter in a book about where California was in the 20th century. I know we're into the 21st century, yeah. but I felt a lot as though he had come back to solve problems that were left unresolved, uh, either from his tenure or from uh, his predecessors. I feel like that the next governor writes really the first chapter of the 21st century California in terms of the economy, in terms of... Uh, the aging of our society and how do we pay for that. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting moment to see the passing of the torch in some way about what California is going to look like as a state of 40 million people. How does it govern itself? How does it function? We've had, it seems like, Jerry Brown for such a long period of time, but those questions really have not been uh, focused on or raised particularly uh, visibly. Uh, uh, they haven't. They haven't. And I think, you know, some uh, critics of Governor Brown would say that he could have done more with, um, with the power that he had over yeah. the political process. He could have looked at structural reform of the tax system in California and those kinds of things. But, you know, the, the, the governor, for all of his broad talk, is somewhat of an incrementalist. He does like to chip away at problems. And I think you saw that in some of his uh, discussions on the state budget and other things. And at the same time, I think he likes to... to um, to look broadly in some ways, uh, like climate change. Yeah. And even that's yeah. an incremental process, but it has been a, a larger discussion. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we haven't had that discussion in a lot of ways. And I, I, both as a journalist and as a Californian, I think it'll be interesting to see. How, with, with the kind of loss of the legacy media, how did this discussion about California's future, I guess there are things like Cal Matters, which offers mm -hmm. information, but how, in terms of bureaus in, in Sacramento now, I mean, there's I mean, television bureaus. Uh, uh, well, I was the last full-time television reporter covering the Capitol when I had a previous job at the ABC affiliate in Sacramento. I, I tell everybody I turned off the light, but I so, left the door so the, open. So they're not there anymore? No. Uh, radio? Is radio is still there. My colleague, my ex-colleagues in public radio still covering mm -hmm. the Capitol. Yeah. But your point, I think, is, is right. Uh, we've had a diminished role of people covering state government uh, out of the capital city. Um, when I came to Sacramento uh, full time in 2001, I had been there earlier and left for a TV job and had come back. But in 2001, the LA Times, of which I now run the bureau, had 14 people in Sacramento. We now have eight. We have eight and that's good. And I'm, I'm pleased for that and I uh -huh. hope we can expand some. We have new ownership of the paper. Uh -huh. um, and I think this is gonna be an exciting time. But uh, the economics of journalism have changed a lot, back to our beginning of our discussion yeah. about information on the phone that you can get everywhere. And I think we're in a period of, um, 
of experimentation a little bit about how we get that. I still, at the end of the day, believe that uh, the quality of what we write uh, matters and that people need to have a place that they can rely on something that explains their world to them. And so I'm hoping that that's what we're going to continue to do. But it has been challenging when there are fewer of us watching, uh, playing the watchdog role, watching the people in elected office. Somebody needs to watch them. So Somebody needed to watch you when you're in office. Somebody needs to watch them. Well, I, you know, the, the, this, the, this issue you raise about uh, the, the agenda that's going to be on the state, the state agenda now with the new governor and pressures from uh, housing and immigration and, and poverty and so forth, uh, um, I, I think that those questions are, are exciting questions that journalists uh, and, uh, have an important role as we were going to proceed into, the, into uh, 2019 and, uh, and beyond, uh, ways that I don't think we fully, uh, fully understand yet. Uh, so. Well, I did want to thank you for, for coming to the, uh, the Randall Lewis seminar. For uh, Anything else? Uh, you know, you, you're, you're around almost everybody who has information about politics. Is there any couple other observations that uh, you picked up this year that uh, seem interesting to you? Uh, well, it's, it's not been, there's, never, there's not been a dull moment uh, in the last uh, really two years of, of covering what's going on in California. I would say... Um, Broadly, somewhat similar to what I've said earlier, I think the most interesting thing is um, what choices are we going to make and our elected officials going to make about the future of the state? I mean, there are very big choices ahead of us. And California, as we know, such a unique place. I said at the outset of this that I'm a, an immigrant from the yeah. East Coast where we don't have the direct democracy system. Californians love, they have a love-hate relationship with ballot measures, but they're going to play an important role in uh, telling their elected officials in Sacramento and on the local level yeah. what they want, what they want to spend on it, and why. And I think that it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see whether more Californians can engage uh, year-round and not just at election time with these kinds of topics because they're complicated and they need to be a, a vital part of this. And so I'm hoping in our role in the press that we can continue to try to give them the right information they need to make those choices. But um, this is an important time. This is a very big uh, moment, yeah. I think, for the future of California. It's going to be interesting to see what Californians uh, think about that and what role they're going to play. I think that's an excellent closure. Thank you very much again for, for coming to the seminar and uh, the timeliness of, uh, of being here and the kind of perspective that you're bringing on this election. Uh, but thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thanks for having yeah. me. Appreciate it. The following programming is made possible through a generous donation from Randall Lewis, Executive Vice President of Upland-based Lewis Operating Companies.